Foreigners and Friendship, a radio program with work in progress and conversations with artists and activists located along a vertical line from Nordic storytelling, selling, crossing the multicultural Mediterranean Sea, heading towards the northeastern shore of Victoria Lake and preparing for a long walk through Bantu heritage all the way to Transkei region in the Eastern Cape, South Africa. Welcome into our horizon. Episode 22. This episode is almost completely in English because we are having conversations with gallery managers in South Africa. We are traveling along the eastern coast from the huge port Durban in Kwasiru Natal, renamed Itikwini Metropolitan Municipality, towards the very much smaller and lazier town of East London. And thereafter finally reaching Gabacha, formerly and also still known as Port Elizabeth. Our travel this time is primarily to attend to private matters in East London. The name of the town has not yet been changed into something less colonial. East London is also where it all began six years ago, at least when it comes to our journey into South African contemporary life. In East London, there are only two public attractions of interest. First and foremost, the Indian Ocean with strong wind and big waves. Secondly, the fact that the town is home of Mercedes-Benz production platform on the African continent, though the latter never caught our attention. But if you are a German engineer, then it probably will be the only thing you care about. In general, there are not much to explore outside Johannesburg and Cape Town if you are into art and culture. Oh, but wait a minute. Now there's a new art gallery in East London. East London of all places. And it is not another Aint Brian. Aint Brian Art Gallery is located in, the be- in a beautiful old building with a nice garden surrounding the building. Unfortunately, this place has been badly maintained and the exhibitions are dull and confusing. The art gallery is run by the municipality. Maybe someone is trying to prove us to be wrong about East London. Since we are already here to spend Christmas holidays and celebrate New Year's Eve, we make a quick decision of giving ourselves a challenge, an episode on the art scene, not only in East London, but along the coastal line in Eastern Cape province. We want to explore contemporary art outside of Johannesburg and Cape Town, beginning with Limani Gallery in East London. Where are we? We have already disclosed where we are. We are in East London. Since we are working with sound, there's no better way than listening to how it sounds getting there and which sound is welcoming us back. Thank <laughs> you. 
We are waiting in the airport in Johannesburg while drinking an Americano or a glass of Chenin Blanc. We do not remember very clearly, but it is just voices in the background. It could have been anywhere. We are listening to the waves from the Indian Ocean in Thentha, which is an area half an hour outside of East London to the north, popular for relaxation during weekends. Also, the waves does not indicate where we are. The problem with sound is profound. It is out of control. You never know if a sound is useful before you listen to it and then it is already too late to change it. Unless you were there yourself recording it, then you keep dreaming about how it could have been different. A better recording device and a bigger, more hairy microphone windshield. There are places I feel before I get to know them. When I step on the ground for the first time and I just know that my life is about to change. Quote from Lerato Mogwakle, the vagabond wandering through Africa on faith, page 144. Nahun Beach is for us such a base. Though our lives had already changed many times, but the waves and the ocean in Nahoon was a dream coming through. Morten Ranum had dreamt of this place 15 years earlier. For this reason, he will always come back, no matter what happens, to look at the waves and to swim in them and return to sit on the beach and wonder what is on the other side of the ocean. The sound of waves and water and ocean from anywhere in the world will always be liberating and set a soul free, and so will traveling. I travel 
because it is only when I'm on the road I get to recreate myself in every moment of my existence. Another quote from The Vagabond by Lorato Mogwatli, Wandering Through Africa on Faith, page 108. Jeg sidder og læser Vagabund, Wandering Through Africa on Faith, skrevet af Lerato Mogatle. Det er mærkeligt. Jeg har læst mange af den her slags bøger, der handler om, hvor mennesker har været, hvor et menneske har været, og fortæller om ting og overflader, som de har passeret. Men det er som om, at der ikke rigtig er noget, der indfanger min opmærksomhed. Der er ikke noget der får mig til at blive stående. Der er ikke noget, der får mig til at forstå det sted, det pågældende menneske har været. Endnu mere mærkeligt er det, fordi at jeg netop har læst John Kutzis bog Summertime, som en biografisk roman, der er opbygget som en øh, række interviews, hvor en biograf interviewer mennesker, som John Kutzi har kendt eller kender, og som udtaler sig om ham som bryder ind i de her interviewer for at tjekke, at de nu bliver citeret rigtigt af denne biograf, som måske, måske ikke er John Kutzi selv. Her befinder vi os på forskellige steder i det sydafrikanske samfund, tilbage i 1970'erne og 1980'erne, og vi har en stærk, meget præcis fornemmelse af, hvor vi befinder os. Og vi er meget nært selskab med de mennesker, som udtaler sig kraftfuldt videnskabeligt om John Kutz. Og så er der selvfølgelig Deborah Levy og hendes bøger, hendes prosa, som er knæsende, brilliant, frodig og med voksne sætninger hvor du virkelig føler, at du er til stede. Du er til stede et sted. Her befinder vi os også ofte i Sydafrika, men ikke kun i Sydafrika. Også andre steder. Denne biografiske prosa, som kunne være en hvilken som helst slags prosa, manifesterer sig som stor sproglig artikulation. En fantastisk prosa, misundelsesværdig på alle måder. Jeg er nu i gang med den anden af Deborah Levis romaner. Vi er reading The Vagabond. Wandering through Africa on faith. It's written by the South African writer Lorato Mogatle. She has been traveling as a vagabond through a number of countries on the African continent and is telling about what she saw or which things that she passed on her way. We have read many of these types of books where an individual, a woman, a man, is telling about things in a shallow way that they have seen or encountered in their journey, but there's nothing that they write that makes us uh, wonder or makes us stand still to think and feel. Maybe because he is nothing to feel, we are not really there, we are never there, because the writer has already gone and continued in other ventures just as shallow as the previous ones. Even more surprising or peculiar or strange is it because we have just read Summertime, a biographical novel by J.M. Kutzi, John Kutzi. The novel is constructed as a number of interviews or conversations with people that knew John Kutzi, 
they are being interviewed or they are talking with the biographer, the person who is writing the biography of John Coates's life. The biographer might or might not be John Coates himself. The people that the biographer is talking to is constantly, or not constantly, but sometimes once in a while, interrupting the conversation to check if they are quoted correctly by the biography. If there's a problem, the biography apologizes and correct the mistake. In the novel, we are uh, in South Africa. We are uh, back in the 1970s and 1980s. We have a very strong and precise experience of where we are located. We are present. We understand who we are talking to. We understand the things that they are explaining. We see John Goodsey. And then, of course, there's also Deborah Levy. Her books and her prose. In the book we have just been reading by Deborah Levy, we are also in South Africa, but we are not only in South Africa. The prose she is creating, she is writing, is crystal clear. It is sparkling like small stars. It is dry and crisp. The sentences are growing like the leaves on the tree in the forest. And we are really alive. We are convinced this biographical prose, who could have been any kind of prose, are manifesting itself as a brilliant forest of reality, of something genuinely. We are alive in her words. And we are there. During six years, coming and going to East London, Morten Ranum has been trying to look for art and culture, but only encountered Guild Theatre, where there is hardly ever any performances. Maybe a school play once a year, and from time to time used for private parties. Next to Guild Theatre, There is a museum with a zoological collection and sometimes a historical exhibition. The museum looks like a shadow and all the exhibited objects are bleached as if no one has been inside the museum for many years. The cafeteria next to the museum seems to always be closed. Down the road from the theater and museum you will find the earlier mentioned and Bryan Art Gallery, who only complete the already established atmosphere of depression. Musical concerts and similar types of performances will always be held in restaurants and beach resources outside town, for example in Zenza. But also those are rare. Therefore, it came to us as a very big and welcoming surprise to suddenly encounter a brand new and very sparkling art gallery, Limani Gallery, in a very centrally placed location in East London, in Nahoon along Old Transkai Road, next to the popular Chow Bella restaurant, for those who are locally acquainted. The woman behind the gallery Sibusi Sisiwe Nodata is normally known as Madame Fashion Eastern Cape. She even received a reward a few years ago to prove her accomplishment in the fashion industry. She has now decided to venture into contemporary art, but is still maintaining the previously established focus on design, fashion, textile and heritage. 
Limani Gallery has three large and bright rooms, two of them dedicated to visual art, sculptures and ceramics. And the third room has a collection of Unica designer clothes. Just after New Year, in the first days of January, we had the opportunity to meet the artistic curator of the gallery, Reggie Lesazzi, for a conversation. My name is Reggie Lesazzi. I was born in Boxberg and I studied medicine for a year. Then I left it. And then I went to these black universities. But eventually I landed into fine arts because that's what I do. So how did you get from medicine to art? I know, I got bored today. I realized that I was in a foreign space. So I think during the first semester I realized I was lost. Mm -hmm. So I went to vets very late. And I was the only black student there at vets. And I was the only black in the department, which was oh. nice. So was my it nice drawing, or was it weird? It or? was nice because my drawings were different from everybody. If we're doing portraits, mine would be different. Mine would be dark, whereas others had blonde features and things. So it was quite fun. When I graduated, I was employed by the Jobeck Art Gallery called the Jack in Jobeck Park. But I worked as an education officer for three years. My job was to design uh, education programs to complement exhibitions. Then at my end of contract, I decided that I want to go and study. I wanted to go and study arts management in London. And then when I came back, I realized the only place to work was in Forte, because that had the most wonderful exhibition. So Forte is, is a university, right? It's a university, yeah. but the collection. Okay, so you didn't end up there because it was specific no, focused no, no. on art. I was interested in the collection. What well, only art gallery for black artists was at Fort Hill. And Brian has got a very historic collection of South African art. Yeah. If you go to in Brian, because I've been there several times over the last They don't years, even show them. It is a strange place to come to because it's like mm. has not really been maintained or There's you get no very echo. confused I about know. what is going on. What is here. the role? So, yeah. and, and I always kind of was a little bit sad about it because it's a it's a it's a brilliant building mm. and there's a lot of rooms, there's upstairs and some yes. rooms downstairs. Yeah. And there's also kind of a room upstairs where it's, it looks like a study or something. Yeah? The so, sad story so what is, about uh, what is your the story the sad story about Brian family and the Bryans did not have children. So before he died, Mr. Brian bequested that building to his wife. That if it if they die, that house must be turned into a gallery and it must be used for free. And they give it to the municipality. What is the challenge of a Brian? Do you think that is that that it belongs to the municipality that yes. is not really interested in it's it? Or is it, is it a question of management? Uh, or now yeah. you're comparing uh, yes. uh, Jack and, and Brian, yeah. and because because there has yeah. been recently there has been yeah. this uh, discussion about yeah. Jack in Joburg about that yes. the, the malfunction of it and the wear down, which is yeah. kind of a little bit similar story yeah, than similar. Brian, because yeah. if you come. When I, last time I was in Jack, yeah. this was uh, three months ago, because I wanted to see, yeah. is it really this bad? It was because bad. I hadn't been yeah, there for was, three or four bad. years. Yeah, it was, and it was, it was, a top, it it was strange, because it's gone, it's gone. Suddenly, uh, the gates are gone, everything. They suddenly come just like yeah. a ruin, yes. where they're supposed to be a, right. a, a, a shop. Yes. Uh, and the pink, and the rooms are really went down. So, the because... Floor, yes. Because but of what the present, what happened there is... Is that the same story as... Same it, story. Yeah. What happened is, uh, you mustn't forget the, the original municipality was run by, uh, what you could call, a national party. For the older... Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. They were interested in their collection, it reflected their history. That's why they could buy those PNFs, because they had the history. But when, when you look now, there was a uh, walk-ins of the new government, the present one which did not really care about that heritage. The problem here is that it is the municipality yes. who runs the idea. It's, it's yes. Joba, yes. Uh, That's the municipality, right. yes. uh, and not... Not national government. Okay. First of all, municipalities have no mandate to maintain museums. They do not have a legal mandate. It's national. So where's the mandate? The, the mandate, mandate is, is with the, national. But they are not funding. They're not doing it. So there is kind of a... See? A confusion there. Yeah, there is a confusion there. But then I left Forte yeah. a few, two years later. I was uh, invited to apply for a job 
There's a project manager to set up a museum from scratch, the so-called Albert Lee Truly Museum. Then I set up a small uh, dealership called Artrends, which is a small company of dealership selling work, uh, going to auction houses, buying affordable pieces, and selling them afterwards to museums. So I sold to a national gallery in Cape Town, and when it was easy, I sold as well. I sold to the job art gallery, and while I was doing that, Linda could me recruit me. The, the art gallery is in PE. The PE is very metropolitan, it's a vibrant city, uh, and it's a metro, but also it's governed by TA. So those things matter. So you mean yeah. because because DA still had they have a more relationship yes. to art and culture. Yes. I was told that, that Leon from Inbrian has been here and talking to you or something. Yeah, no we engaged that, with him. We went is, to uh, we went to see him. Yeah. That was our plan. Or before you went we went to see him. Yes. Or he came here. No, before, no, he, we went to see him. Okay. Bush and I, I told Bush, let's go and consult this guy. Yeah. I think he needs to get us so that we're excited and we want him to be excited too. Yeah. He's so excited. went to him. Yeah, he was excited. He says, okay. great. He even came to the opening. I invited him. He came. So he also says he, he will continue to feed in some ideas, even names, if we want them in the future. Before Christmas, when we were talking here, uh, you talked also about um, developing a kind of a residentship or a retreat yes. or something. Yes. And, and maybe this building, in Brian building, is would be good for Perfect. for making a yeah, retreat a because, because yeah. that it is a charismatic building. Of course, mm. it will need some mm. renovation. Maybe you could try to uh, to talk about some of these aspects. Yeah. You, yeah. you mentioned that Leon actually gave you this idea of yes. Claudia. Claudia Hock. Hmm? Yeah, Claudine Hock. And she's German. Yes. She's German, but she's living in, in South, South Africa. Africa. Yes, she's been here for many years now. She's exhibited in Brian many times, and then she stopped. Because but she's she, living here close to East London. Right? Yeah, she lives in Kinza. But has she also been exhibited other places? I like the word other places. You know, she refers to these other places as framers. Framers. You framers. know those framers who call themselves galleries. Places where they you are making frames for art pieces or for, yes. pieces for, for photographs yes. who sometimes call themselves art galleries, yes. but which is not <laughs> an art gallery yes. like yeah. we are talking about. Yes. Like yeah. Claudia here, her paintings is quite big yeah. and it is quite it is oil on, on canvas. canvas and has How would you describe it? Has a, her work is very special. She invented a technique which I have not come across until I met her. When she paints on the canvases, which is mostly abstract, she allows it to dry over a period of one year. That means these paintings, when she's done them, she lets them dry. Okay. Once she dries, they dry it, like finish a real full year. Then she creates, she takes a grinder, you know, a grinding tool. Mm -hmm. And then she kind of scrape it. Scrape it. Scrape like the paint the off. The layers off, yes. Yeah. To get the layer underneath. So she has been painting in, in, in a couple of layers already, yeah, already. in the first place. Yes. And then they and then scrape it and then something will, will remain. Something. Remains, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Some new colors come out which are not, were not initially in the in And the that is why it looks, uh, yeah. yes, that's that is why it looks, because it looks quite thin yeah. and you can actually see the structure of the yeah. canvas yeah. through and yeah. there's even some, some tearing. Which There's is some also intended. And is, is this intended? Yes, yeah. intentional. Okay. You see, I've, I like the way because it shows a new direction of but work. But will she then? This is what I call new direction of work. But will she, will she kind of paint on top of it again after scratching? She could off. paint because she, she's just found this experimentation and she found that it works. She writes, this she wrote after the... This she writes something after. after. That is after scraping. Yes. Yeah, so then she write with yeah. a pen or? Yeah, so the pen or crowd or charcoal, for instance, these circles. <coughs> Can you see them? There's circles in the center in of these, afterwards. yeah. And yeah. then there's some writing to the yeah, left here. Writing. Yeah. Wow. Interesting work, you see. And some marks as well. Yeah. And these here, they look like charcoal. It shows that she's actually interacted with this canvas heavily. 
before letting it go or stop working on it. And I look at the tearing here. But one of the things she wanted to do on this painting was to remove the spine and paint it white and okay. put it back so that the white can come out on those holes. Okay. I was a bit uh, worried. I said, what if you can put it back? <laughs> but actually I thought at some point when I yeah. looked at this painting, I thought it was like a cross, a cross or it's like yes. a window that you look out of, yes. out of somehow, great, which yeah. is, has an interesting effect, I think. Yes, absolutely. Because you are kind of uh, looking through the painting mm. in some strange way. Yes, absolutely. To understand it right, so she wanted to remove Fine. this yeah. and then simply paint, 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 white, paint white, white so that you get a new, <coughs> a beautiful effect coming through these holes. She wanted to paint it white behind. Yeah. Yes. In the frame, in on the, the frame, frame, on the frame, on the wood. Yeah, okay, I understand. Yeah. So it didn't, it, and I discouraged it. But you are afraid of uh, what? Yeah, what, what? You are afraid of what? Because exactly? it's fragile. You mean you are afraid that this would be too? Uh, no, it, the color is fine. Rough, I really or? like it. I like. I would like to see the white coming out. It's just that the the whole exercise of removing it and putting it back might not go back again, because this is yeah. a very fragile wood. Can you see it? It's already ripped a lot. Yes. I mean, there was plenty of dust there, which yes. is accumulated from, from the crime. And then there are, over here we have, they are then only the canvas, which is kind Not of, stretched. Which is unstretched. Uh, almost yeah. a bit Hung as a installation, yes. You can see the light from outside. Yeah. And the they are part. hanging in the window, so we can see yes. the see. This one works both ways. You can so there is a painting on both sides. Which is very Which unusual. is uh, distinctive. Yeah, you can see the writing there. But she has she painted on both sides. What she did, oil I oil think this went through. Thing, this went through, as you can see. And then in our discussion, I, so I, I mean, was convinced. She painted on this side. Yeah, no, she painted this side, and then this side she had what you call a backing. Okay, look behind you. She had a backing of paper to prevent the the whole surface to be covered. So whenever it was dry, then she'll peel it off. Oh, she peeled so off the paper. Paper, these are the remains. Oh, okay, yeah. And then she liked this, and then she yeah. said, is it possible if we can use this both sides? So no, it's fine. I'm yeah. more than happy. I just need to think how I'm going to hang it. Yeah. So that's why it took us a long time to yeah. come up with this thought. Yeah. Initially, we used these uh, office clips, yeah. but then we also found these uh, clips for canvas. And oh, yes, this, one, two. this, one's double. this is uh, two, two yes, yes. Because you see the, the one at the back is plain. And if we had this one plain, it would look like inside. It would look ugly. So we put this one so it have two pieces. Okay. So that's how we put prices there, three of them, because okay. we know there's three works here. Then Andrew, there's this uh, works was made on vinyl. Andrew, Andrew Modric. Modric, yes. And Andrew's work is quite uh, humorous. Just like his ceramics, because he has he has these uh, works which is paint on on vinyl, yes. and then he also has ceramics. Ceramics, and the yes. two type of works are quite yeah uh, full of humor. Difference, yeah, somehow. different. Yeah, medium different. But medium. here we have this vinyl is kind of it has a dark dark back background, yes. and then it's medium, quite it's colorful and, and it's it's, uh, he used the sketch tool. Because this is scratched through yeah. the paint. Um, yes, yeah, scratched through the paint. Yeah. But also use what you could call collage to bring in shapes. He paints and brings shapes, he casts the shapes. And he sprinkles paint, sprinkles ink. I call it ink because it's not paint, using a brush. Brush? It is ink, like, but how is it applied? I don't know. It's applied it's by, a, using by a brush, brush or yeah, using a by spray? Yeah, or spray, yes. I thought it was toothbrush initially, but spray could be possible as well. Because all these marks that you are talking about now, this is kind of small figures or small, mm. it looks, some of them look like creatures or human yeah, like or human. faces. Yes, looks like human. But they have this kind of collage. Uh, yes, yes. In, Approach on it, yes, yeah. I mean, this looks like a hand. Uh, this looks like a small vehicle or a boat, mm -hmm. someone sitting on a boat. Very childish. I mean, look at the yeah. depiction of the fish. And this also is a collage. But you can see all that influence from Norman Catherine's work. Because she was influenced by Norman Catherine. Mm -hmm. Especially on those two. Because there's, there's this one, and then there's uh, this two. the other one, there's two yeah. more. Three, yeah. I think. There's this yeah. one. Yes, there's this one. Which is similar to the first yeah. one, which is yeah. also very dark. 
Yeah. And having yes. uh, collage applications yeah. on it. I think what it did on this vinyl, I think he finds it white. So when the vinyl is white? White. From the beginning? Yes. And, and then he puts, it. so I mean, this yes. is... It's the spread. area where there is white, it's, it's not original. It's, all, it's not original. Okay. So he made it black, and when he scratches, the oh, white then the comes white out. Comes up. So there's one who is actually white. When there's a white one. one. He's just put, yeah, he's not put black, black on it. Yeah. He's instead, he's uh, so used they, black to draw. This white one, there's mm. a lot of whites, so he yeah. has not painted it. not painted, yeah. Oh. There's very little scratching, you see. This one he painted black and scratched again. And then this one he painted, but he didn't do any. So he's put a lot of collage. He calls this Philip Cotton College. That's him, all right? It's himself. Yeah. Okay. That's what he calls That is so. Yes. Then you see himself. So he doesn't attempt to make a portrait of him. He just cuts it and pastes it. Yeah, because this is a photograph of him. Yes. Yeah. And then he has cut out. You can see the eyes yeah. and the nose and the mouth. Yeah. 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 And then here you see quite a lot of surfaces. You can see layer. The pink on top of blue, blue, red, under, on top of yellow. These patches of, of yeah. surfaces, which is a nice interplay of surfaces, which is done. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit connected to some type of pop art somehow. Yes. Uh, well, it's also I'm using this application. Yes. Or oh, it looks like application art. Yes. I mean, uh, this shows... Almost also, like, like that you have printed on it. This one is from the Beatles. What's his name? Oh. McCarthy. Paul McCarthy. Yeah, and the wife. Yes, yeah. when she was young still. This one also. I only realized after a couple of days that this looks like one of those Mexican hats. Yes. I only looked at the eyes. Yeah. But there's a mixture of things, the collages, and look, it's starting to look like a frame. Using a masking yeah. tape. Again, these images and mixing them with cut out shapes. This is, is a moustache. Yes, yeah, it looks like a moustache. There's a heart there with monster. Yes. And friendly fire. Yes. And the tip there, I don't know what it's doing here. And this looks like a hand as well. The aesthetic, aesthetics is a little bit similar to, you know, if they work with actual children, sometimes yes. you ask them to to cut out something and then glue it on top. Oh, just, yes. Yeah, yeah. As yeah. a way of doing yes. collage. In, yes, that's right. Yeah. And he likes to play with three-dimensional things because you think you can't see 3D things, but there it shows you that he's actually quite aware of what is 3D. And there's that ink thing. I'm, I'm not sure if it's, it was intentional or, or it did not sit on the yeah. piece. It's, it's flowing down and he's allowing it to flow. But the white ones for me are better because he has not used so much. And yeah, he also tries and decorates his surfaces, textures. Very stylized and simple things. These look like cigarette parts. But this work, this work, and also this work of the square, with mm. the is more kind of figurative. Figurative. Uh, Why yes. the others we have been talking abstract. about until now is more yes. abstract. Yes. Than and these ones connect to the history of this province, about the experience living here. Uh, because already the title is, is Tosa. And I'm sure in other cultures, they don't sit like this. I don't think men in Job sit like this. They might sit in a different context, because it's a modern international environment. Yeah. Whereas this is rural, mm -hmm. which somehow connects you to indigenous uh, dress. I mean, you and I are in the center of these uh, initiation rites and celebrations where people celebrate their culture initiation and being uh, promoted from being young boys in Fana to a real man. So this could be a initial discussion about initiation. So these are really important uh, works. They really connect in a sense. Yeah. Uh, and despite being a rural subject, but the treatment is very impressive. And you can see that McCallum is using these big crash strokes as opposed to thin. Of course, there are other layers behind, but it's mostly big brush strokes. I would have said that white was the latest uh, strokes, but I think yellow are the last ones to lay on, on this canvas. Red is the only one there. Very floating images. Very floating. Well, you see, you see uh, 
some people from the front in yes. a public yes. place, and there's a child in front of us with yes. something in and his hand. Yes. Yeah. And a very simplified approach to creation of depth. As you can see, this is a middle ground. There's a background, but there's a depth there as well. We can't see it properly because we're close to the image. But if we stand far away, we we'll probably see further depth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and we don't even know if this kid is the is one of the kids in the other image. It could be one yeah, of we these kids. Three, we have three girls. Yeah, you know, have this hairstyle uh, is the one. Yeah. They are doing something with their hands. With their, looking yes. at their hands. <laughs> yes. Uh, one is pointing. Yeah, the other with is looking. And they are kind of looking. Yeah. yeah, a little bit, not really at each other, but towards each mm. other. So then, then the having, a, having a conversation. Sisters having a conversation with the child. Yeah. And these are triplets. That is these a bit rare. Triplets. I realized that in cultures further north, also yes. Bantu cultures, there is a, if somebody gets twins, it's a certain kind of honor, and yeah. they will actually be get a certain kind of name if you are father of twins. So how is it in South Africa on course of I culture? I don't know. Is it, a, is, it a, is, it a, is it a specific honor to get more than one child? And they believe that the baby comes first actually is young. Uh, Younger than yours. Young, yeah, the one who comes last is older because she helped to have the first one delivered. So like pushed him out. Okay, that's so, it's nice. another belief. Nice way of putting it. Yes. So, so then it, they are, it is not really connected, it's not, it's not conceived as twins. No, it's not conceived as twins. If, because they come out of different and, times. Yeah, different times. Okay. I mean, I came out, I was the first one to come out, but I'm considered small, because she came last, so she's uh, older than me. She, she's regarded as the wisest. And they believe the person who comes last will make moves build a career, move, uh, mature quicker, because the, the, the biggest achievement was to push the first baby out, and now they have to find a way. Thank you very much. We oh, have sure. been through your career. We <laughs> and now we are back to contemporary everyday life, yes. which maybe is a nice way of uh, concluding. Yes. So thank you for your time. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. After East London, we spent a week in Johannesburg and was reminded why we love the bigger urban spaces. But we already purchased a bus ticket to Durban and we are on our way. In the bus, the people around us begin eating as soon as they sit down. Morten Ranum is concentrating on the scenery we are passing through. In Durban, we are having a conversation with the director of Durban Art Gallery. I am Mtutuzi Tragaza, director of the Durban Art Gallery under the Eteguini municipality. And the Durban Art Gallery is um, in the city hall, which is uh, on the second floor of the building. On the first floor, we have the museum, the natural museum, and on the ground floor, we have the library. Now we are sitting here in, in an art museum. And mm. How do you um, how do you think about art's possibility of, of uh, role, or which which role are art contemporary art today play? Mm. The way we think about art, we know that art should be used as as a tool of a communication between the artist and society, yeah. but. That is what artists try to do. They try to do that. But if they work against the global agenda, both of us know very well that uh, they can be crushed. The kind of art that I see today is not easily accessible to the ordinary man on the street. It can be understood by the educated elite and those who, who are used to art, those who are uh, visually literate. But for those who are not visually literate, it, it, it remains difficult to understand. And something that I'm not going to deal with because yeah. I, I think it's weird. And, uh, Especially in these uh, so-called third world countries. 
in the so-called third world countries, art itself is very elitist. That is the problem. So when we talk about society, we talk about society with the exclusion of people who are supposed not to be intellectually initiated. So you mean that, that art has in some ways also removed itself from, from this public uh, communication? Yeah, or, definitely. Uh, and, and then we are, we are kind of centered in, in Khan, you would say, uh, an academic circle where yeah, there are few people. Definitely. Uh, and they also take the politics out mm. of, or takes the politics away from. Yeah, from, no, from, no, from the ordinary people. Yeah. The challenge that we are dealing with in this country, I don't know how many people are dealing with it, because I, all, I often suspect that some people are just relaxed. They think everything is going very well, but there's a big challenge. The challenge is how do we bring art to the people? Not in a physical sense, but in an intellectual sense. Yeah. For example, During the upper 30 years in this country, the white government didn't encourage and didn't even fund art education to black people. So our schools were without art. There was no art in black schools, but there was gardening and something they called craft because they claimed, well, blacks could not understand create or even appreciate art because they were not intellectually endowed to do that, to be able to do that. It was based on, on a racial stereotype, which was not true, of course. But which also kind of separated craft and art from each other. Right? This that separation we, of... We, well, I, I come from nowhere where well, there's also yes. a separation, but it's a general yeah, separation. Yeah, you, you see, this separation uh, uh, between art and craft is very interesting because it is a problem that has never been resolved. And I, I don't hear academics working on this problem. They are very quiet and they are just going on and on with whatever they are doing. We are supposed to be correcting the wrongs of the past, but we don't seem to be doing that. I think the problem that we are having nowadays is the problem of class in addition to the problem of race. Black people are not the same, unfortunately. There are black people and there are other black people. Yeah. The black people who there is this who otherness. Became yeah. Somehow. yeah, there is this element of otherness which is very dominant in this country. Those things are very problematic, but they also affect the way we convey knowledge, especially knowledge about art, the way we, we cultivate a sense of appreciation of art. Even when we want to do something as a public art museum, we often find that uh, resources are very scarce, very limited. Ideas are there, But, but resources are quite limited. So, and that is kind of a priority from the side of the government? Unfortunately, in this country, we have a government that is now being run by black politicians, mainly black politicians. Uh, we have a few white people um, in opposition parties. These black people, some of whom were in exile in Europe and yeah. elsewhere in the world, they still don't regard art as a priority. I, I just don't understand why. Because some of them are educated, and some of them were exposed to this culture of creating art when they were in exile. They were exposed to all yes. those cultural yeah. uh, aspects. But I just don't understand why, when they are back at home, they don't see the significance of supporting, truly supporting art. I think I read That's somewhere it. that this art museum, this art gallery here, actually have had kind of a focus on that relationship, art and craft, for many years. Yes, yes, Even for before, many years. Uh, before apartheid ended, it was also, That's there was it. this focus on, on merging the two. 
I was thinking that that what is 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 this a kind of a strategy or can we use this kind of uh, that is so true instead of merging it can this be used for kind of uh, reinventing uh, our knowledge yeah. or connection art administrators and managers of uh, art um, of public art museums have always been aware of this problem but here at uh, the Deben Art Gallery there has been a culture of collecting craft but also there has been an attempt to encourage people to look at craft as something that is almost at the same level as art there is this interesting interesting reality that we have once a piece of craft has been collected and included mm. in a public art collection then it is seen as art not craft anymore so then you maintain <laughs> the separation because you're but moving, also but also moving, in, you're moving mm. an object into another space so i mean what happens is when you collect a piece of craft mm. and include it in our collection somehow we indirectly obliterate this notion that it is craft automatically it is seen as art because it is displayed in the same exhibition space in the yeah. gallery the narrative you are trying to describe now actually tells us that that we cannot just regard art and craft and relationships between them as an isolated thing because it's part of a broader kind of structure yes of power somehow maybe or of or of how mm -hmm. we value things and uh, and then it becomes a lot broader picture if you want to reinvent these skills and give them value then mm -hmm. Then we have to work on how we are valuing things in general. We have to, speaking, uh, and also how society works somehow. Because this is yeah. this is what you're describing is that mm -hmm. this is a reflection of a certain kind of society that cannot think about things as both equal mm -hmm. and different. But what we are doing as the Deben Art Gallery, we run art workshops, and we don't try to to change what people are doing, but we try to encourage them to improve. Yeah. the quality of whatever they are doing so that they can actually regard visual art as part of their culture because many people believe that art is is like a white culture but then if we go to townships and and other rural areas if we go there and say okay we are running a workshop and people get some skills and then we select the best work out of that workshop and then we exhibit that work but in order to make people understand that visual art is part of their culture we make sure that a local leader in that particular area will come and open those exhibitions in yeah. isizulu yeah. if there are people who speak isizulu there okay when we go to areas that are occupied by mostly by indian people then it will be english so that people can now start accepting visual art and craft within it as part of their culture daily life thank you very much for thank you thank you time. for having me on your on your on your wonderful program to conclude our journey we are flying south along the coast to port elizabeth who was not named after the queen of england but named after the wife of the british governor rufan shaw duncan who was in charge of the colonization of the area Welcome here at our gallery today. Thank you for coming to visit us. Um, my name is Anna Stewart and I'm the gallery manager of the GFI Art Gallery here in Port Elizabeth in Kobecha. And um, GFI stands for Gucci Family Investments. It's a private, privately owned gallery. Basically, the mission of the gallery is to, to support our local artists and give them exposure. Gucci family investment, what is that exactly? So it's the Gucci family. Gucci family is a family that ran Coca-Cola in South Africa. A Mr. Philip Ronan Gucci, he purchased the house and he lived yeah. here. And in 2000, the year 2000, he passed away and it was his wish that the gallery be developed into an art gallery. Our main focus is basically on local artists and Eastern Cape artists. Yeah. I get an impression that this is the kind of art who's here is also including crafts or 
or how is this relate? How do we re- view this relationship between what we can between call the... fine arts and yes. and the tradition for craft, which is also in some ways kind of art, but maybe not always mm. regarded as such. So I would say we focus on fine arts. Yeah. At the moment, we have paintings on display from the Spear Arts Trust. It's an initiative um, of the Spear Arts Trust, and they call it the Creator Blocks where they actually select um, artists from over South Africa. Mm-hmm. We we focus on on paintings, drawings, yeah. ceramics. We have the Eastern Cape ceramics yeah. exhibiting upstairs. We have the creative blocks on the ground floor. Yeah. And then we also have the Kaiskama Art Trust and they do embroidery works. So I would say typically em- embroidery and beadwork and stuff like yeah. that is not always considered fine art, but it has I think over the past few years, really grown into actually crossing the boundary between crafts and fine arts. And the Kaiskama Arts Trust is situated in Hamburg. It's a group of ladies that does the embroidery and they tell stories through their embroidery yeah. work. To come back to, you know, craft and fine art, mm-hmm. I think in the past few years there has been quite a shift in actually mediums that artists use all over the world and tapas like f- fabrics and um, tapestries and like that actually has crossed over the boundary of being also considered as a fine art. So when you're talking about this difference that, that craft has, has been given or getting closer to fine art, do you see any um, explanations for what is, why is this happening now in these years? Because I think you're really right. I have been to a lot of bigger, larger mm. exhibitions around the world where textile and fabric is suddenly yes. integrated in the artworks yes. in another way that we saw before. So I'm really yes. interested in what causes such a development. Is it, is it a coincidence or why are we, are we specifically interested in this kind of heritage nowadays? I, um, think, I think that's the key. I, I would say if you look at the case Karma Arts Trust, it would be for them, it would just be an easy medium to yeah. to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it started initially from women being able to to find something that they can do, something that they might have been taught growing up yeah. and have had exposure to. And it's easier for them to to learn it, learn the skill. Yeah. You know, fabrics are easier to get hold of. It's less expensive. And then, for instance, canvas and paint. So for certain for, for certain people, for certain it might, yes, certain it might just be yeah. easier, yeah. an easier access. For, for other artists, I think it's something new and something different to use. It's a different type of medium. Some artists might be getting bored of just painting and drawing. But it's not only the fabrics, it's like using paper, for instance, in their work, or just using different mediums or mixing mediums. Yeah. Maybe it maybe it also comes from the fact that, you know, with the environment, people want to have less impact on the environment and protect yeah. the environment. Environment. It might also come from that aspect where people want to reuse mm-hmm. a stuff that have yeah. previously been thrown away and make something beautiful of it. Maybe that's a good way of uh, concluding. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All three conversations will later be available in full length as bonus tracks and podcasts on Mixcloud, Spotify, and other of your preferred platforms. Du har lyttet til Fremmedhed og Bekendtskab. Vi findes også på thewhiteafricanblogspot.com og du kan gå i vores fodspor ved at betræde in my footstep WordPress. Kom. Vi er tilbage her på kanalen hver tirsdag aften klokken 19.00 på Tremala Radio. You have listened to Tremala Radio. We'll be back every Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock. You can uh, also find us on the whiteafricanblogspot.com and you are welcome to walk in our footsteps by stepping into in my footstep wordpress.com